Good morning everyone. Welcome to the Decode Science BGI Stomics Breakfast Workshop here at the Multiomics 2022 Conference. I'm Richard Harrison, Director of Business Development at MGI, and I'll be your MC for this session. I'm sure you'll agree, uh, it's a, after a very successful day one agenda, um, that while this may be the last conference on the 2022 calendar, it's by no means the least, and for many people it's been well worth the trip to come up here. Um, and in particular, we're thankful that so many people have come out early on a, a Monday morning um, to join this breakfast session. Um, we really do appreciate your effort in coming along, um, and um, I'm hoping the, the catering is sufficient and keeps you well geared up for the day. Um, I'd like to point out we have a healthy presence of BGI and MGI people in the room and on the booth later. And I'd like to call out our great partners at Decode Science. You can see Joshua and Peter up there wearing company blue. That's great. So um, if you have any questions afterwards, you don't get your questions answered during these talks, please feel free to call us out at the booth and, and have a conversation. Um, if you've forgotten, now's a good time to silence your phones. Uh, this is a breakfast session, so a little less formal, so if you do need to sneak out and top up your coffee and come back, that's perfectly okay. We have three short presentations for you this morning. Firstly, um, we'll have our application scientist, Kira Sun, who'll give you a short introduction to the field of stomics for the, and stereo-seq for those who may not be across it yet. Um, and Kira will also give a few pointers on where the technology is going in the near future and how you can get involved. Then we'll move on to the main event with our guest speakers and early access partners for Stomics Technology. Uh, there'll be Jennifer Carendi of the Harry Perkins Institute in Western Australia and Quan Nguyen of the Institute of Molecular Biosciences here in Brisbane. Quan's going to talk about his work using StereoSeq to investigate the ageing process and Jennifer is going to combine StereoSeq and another novel technology from JumpCode, also available through our Decode partners, that increases the resolving power of this already pretty powerful technology. We'll be keeping to time today as we uh, have to be finished in time for the main agenda and give you time for a bio break beforehand, but I think we should still have plenty of time for questions. So let me bring on our first speaker. Uh, Dr. Kira Sun joined the not-for-profit BGI Research Institute as a senior researcher in 2017 after obtaining her PhD in biotechnology in Ghent University in Belgium. She's engaged in the development of novel high-throughput metagenome sequencing technologies and in research in taxonomic assignment and functional studies of diverse microbial samples in fields as wide as soil health and rainforest ecology. Kira also has a number of first author publications in leading journals such as Nature Communications, Plant Biotechnology Journal and the Journal of Fungi. Kira currently acts as the field application scientist supporting the applications of BGI spatial transcriptomics innovation in Australia and New Zealand. So Kira's talk today is titled An Accessible Stomics Workflow for Any Laboratory. Thank you, Kira. Thank you for the nice uh, introduction, uh, Richard. So uh, I will give a short background of our technology and um, um, the future applications and how you're going to join us. <clears throat> like those uh, journal presents, the power of uh, uh, stereotech technology uh, on the embryogenesis development, uh, including many different kinds of uh, species, and also the brain science, and um, also in the plant part, um, the study, <coughs> sorry, of uh, Rhabdopsis leaf development, and we also have a lot of uh, preprints in different areas like uh, cancer research um, and other uh, area are coming out um, like in the near future. So those publications empowers the um, stereotech uh, to facilitate um, and accelerate the research. Uh, so uh, back to the principle of the technology that we uh, have this technology based on our um, DNA nanovore um, patent arrays, and that they are randomly located on the silicon chip, uh, which is uh, has customized size, and the biggest part is 16 centimeter by 16 centimeter, which means that you need a bigger cryostate to do the sections. Um, but back to the 
uh, sit, um, back to the DNA nanoboy, there are distance between each DNA nanoboy is 500 uh, nanometer from center to center. That for a mammalia size of uh, 10 micrometer, it contains 400 DNA nanoboys to do the capture racing of the whole transcriptome. So um, there's uh, DNA oligos on the DNA, uh, DNA nanoboy to record the coordinating information. And after the first sequencing, the coordinate information was, uh, was gate, and then it goes to the linkage of the uh, poly-T and the UMI for um, initiate the capture probes. Uh, so our product is go with a chip that uh, contains all those elements, and then when you re um, re receive the, the, the kit, um, people will start the lab work from the cryo state and like laying the tissue on the capturing chip and after several steps that in wet lab, uh, for instance, the permeabilization, reverse transcription, all the transcripts from the tissue section are captured and being pulled into one tube uh, for library construction. So in the end, after a run, um, after a experiment of about one and a half day, you will get the whole transcriptome results um, like located in a single tube. And that one goes for sequencing, and in the end you will have the step six exhibited, the whole transcriptome profiling from an intact tissue section. And this is um, illustrate the experimental steps, um, but to save some time here today, you can also visit our website, uh, which is, um, uh, uh, still, still make take um, to find out more details and the detailed protocols and the videos to guide you how to uh, work through this. Uh, like towards to the future, next year we will have the automation systems um, uh, from the post imaging to uh, library prep um, preparation to save a lot of time and accelerate the speed of the experiment. So it is uh, can be expected with uh, less than 30 minutes hands-on time of experimental process, and um, uh, you can you can do perform 24 chips processing capacities in one day, and uh, the whole procedures will be will about seven days um, end to end. Um, so the whole pipeline from uh, the for the steel sake is not only about the uh, STO mix kit, but it's also um, available for uh, from the BGI group like the MGI to provide the sequencing uh, systems that we have. Um, like some of you already have the G400, and um, it has higher throughput of uh, from our DNB6 TNEX systems. Um, that you can also visit our uh, MGI website to look for the details of the throughput of those different sequencing uh, sequencers. And for downstream analysis of uh, the uh, data generated from, uh, from that, we have our in-house developed ACW stereosic analysis workflow and the steropi. So the original idea to develop those pipelines is because um, that stereosic can um, like generates so much amount of data that no other technologies can be compared. So would, we would like to have our own developed pipelines to uh, facilitate to analyze those amount of data at single cell resolution. Right now, uh, we have this technology applied um, on so many different species and tissues uh, for uh, human tissue and mouse tissue and also other uh, different uh, animal models that we applied nearly um, like across all the organs. Um, so it means that uh, stereosic is very applicable for many different kinds of research of interest. And uh, for um, plant species, we are also um, trying to establish um, a mature workflow to facilitate, um, but due to the difference of the um, um, plant tissues, that it also involves a lot of um, uh, studying and um, developing of those um, pre-treatments. 
So yeah, like I previously mentioned, and this is our website, uh, it has the product information and the resources of the protocols, the videos, and also the latest news. Uh, for instance, last month we have this um, uh, grant thing to promote um, our technology, but you can get the latest news from the website as well. And in the end, I um, would like to um, welcome um, people that join us, the Special Temporal Omics Consortium. Um, I think the videos also introduced that um, where we're wanting to uh, build this community to facilitate um, this area development and to have this joint force to push through more scientific um, like breakthroughs to benefit science and clinical users. Um, I would like to have the update on the STOMix product uh, uh, that has been released. And uh, you can start to order that um, product. It will have uh, the features of the chip on the slide, which is easily for handle. And it supports fresh frozen sample. And with uh, upgraded chemistry that improves capture efficiency, um, like about almost a double capture efficiency compared to the um, publications that we published on Nature and Science. So more powerful um, of this product. And uh, we have uh, provided the cell segmentation algorithm to provide the single cell um, uh, resolution analysis pipeline. And um, in the future, we will have more powerful um, image pro uh, progressing software that you will see that uh, it's more visible and hands on on those um, new updates. So finally, uh, due to the uh, timing, and I would like to thank you all for getting up, uh, join us at uh, our breakfast workflow, and uh, welcome to join our uh, stock consortium as well. Thank you. Um, any questions for Kira? Uh, okay, thanks, Kira. Okay, so now moving on to the, the main agenda with our guest speakers. Um, Dr. Kwan Nguyen is well known to many here and is a group leader at the Institute of Molecular Biosciences at the University of Queensland. He's leading the Genomics and Machine Learning Lab to study neuroinflammation and cancer immune cells at single cell resolution and within spatial morphological tissue context. His research interest is about revealing <coughs> gene and cell regulators that determine the states of the complexity of cancer and neuronal ecosystems. Particularly, he is interested in quantifying cellular diversity and the dynamics of cell-to-cell -cell interactions within the tissues to find ways to improve cancer diagnosis or cell type specific treatments uh, or the immunoinflammation responses that cause neuronal disease. Uh, Dr. Kwan's GML lab is also developing experimental technologies that enable large-scale profiling of spatial gene and protein expression, spatial omics, in a range of cancer tissues focusing on brain and skin cancer and in mouse brain and spinal cord. Kwan's talk is titled, Building Spatial Multi-Organ Aging Clocks. If you'd like to welcome Kwan to the stage. Thank you, Richard, for the nice introduction, and thank everybody for attending the uh, morning session today. Um, so uh, my talk will be about the aging research, and uh, I think this is a very interesting area and topic that are um, very suitable for using spatial technology as well. So uh, uh, why, why are we studying aging? Is it because uh, the uh, it, it soon, uh, we will have about more than 2 billion people that are older than 60 years old. And this is not a problem of a developed country, but it's also a problem of uh, developing countries. For example, we see in, in this uh, plot here, the orange and green color showing the increase in the number of people that are older than 60 years old and uh, the increased uh, rate is actually higher in uh, low developed uh, countries compared to the developed country. So it is a global issue. And uh, aging is a uh, main risk factor of many diseases. Uh, for example, for the cardiovascular disease, neurodegeneration disease, 
uh, immune-related disease, uh, metabolic uh, disease and cancer. And uh, importantly, different uh, organs uh, in the human uh, body um, uh, cause uh, different types of diseases. And the airing rate uh, between different organs are also very different. We are especially interested in the question that uh, how different organs age differently and how the communication between organs in the body can uh, contribute to the aging process of the whole body system. And uh, we uh, ask uh, which method would be most suitable to answer that kind of question. Um, then uh, we uh, decided to use spatial uh, technology. And uh, the reason for that is because uh, uh, we uh, think that uh, the cells in the organ actually interact with each other and they signal between cells uh, and which technology would be most suitable for studying cell-to-cell -cell interaction. Uh, I, we believe that the spatial technology by measuring all genes um, and uh, by locating the neighboring cells can allow us to identify the interaction within organ and also interaction between organs and see how that interaction affects the aging process. Uh, eventually, we want to build different aging clocks or different organs. Um, and uh, uh, here in this uh, study, we study, uh, we extracted um, uh, five different organs uh, from uh, mice. Um, the idea of this is that uh, uh, if we have a much organ in one uh, mouse, we could uh, really link the aging process between organs uh, to uh, each other. Um, and we applied uh, uh, two spatial technologies as the uh, independent uh, and complementary technologies. And we also use the single cell uh, rna seq data to validate the results. Um, um, so uh, with the help of uh, Kira and with the collaboration with the um, uh, BI team, uh, our lab uh, led uh, by uh, two uh, uh, experimentalists in my team, uh, Yufan and Albert, uh, have uh, successfully generated the spatial data for uh, five different organs. And uh, uh, it is uh, quite uh, 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 ordinary to uh, have uh, the optimization uh, from one organ to the other organ because there's a uh, the quite different uh, condition. For example, here I'm showing the uh, the, the uh, kidney uh, and the color we are seeing here is the cDNA signal from the uh, the tissue. So if it's uh, uh, brighter, that means that that's a better condition uh, for um, the uh, sequencing. Um, and uh, and if it's too bright, that means that a diffusion process may happen. So in here we show that uh, 15 minutes is the best. Uh, uh, the uh, permeabilization time for the kidney. And uh, when we saw the uh, results, uh, it's, it's really um, uh, uh, the, the kind of result that we, 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 uh, we, 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 we expected for. So in here we see the color, each color represents uh, one uh, cell type or one, uh, one tissue type. And this is the kidney, so we can see uh, clearly the uh, single cell uh, single cell resolution, the three layers of the kidney, so the cortex here, and this is the uh, medulla and inner medulla, and, and that's uh, at the single cell resolution. We can also see the mixing between different color. That means that we can identify different cell types per layer of the kidney as well, and uh, all of this is come from a data-driven way. Uh, so. Um, uh, when we uh, look into the detail of the brain uh, data, so uh, we can see in, in general, this is the uh, QC uh, information where we have a, this is the number of genes per sample, so very consistent between samples. And then this is the number of reads per sample, so quite high number of reads per sample. Um, and here uh, I'm showing bin 80, uh, that is the interesting part of this data that I will explain next. So um, because the resolution of the ST or MIS technology is uh, 0 0.2 micrometer, uh, so that means that we have the flexibility to look at the data at different resolution, at different tissue scale. Uh, so it can be ranged from, uh, uh, it can range from single cell resolution uh, like this. So that's been 14, uh, been 14 means that there are 14 bits per uh, uh, per dimension, X and Y dimension, and uh, that's uh, that equivalent to 
one single cells, the size of one single cells. But then we also have uh, the flexibility to uh, look at the bigger um, uh, tissue unit. For example, we can go to bin 50, and this is the signal from bin 50. Uh, and if we want, we can also go to other higher um, size, for example, bin 200. And uh, the benefit of this if, if, is, is, uh, is if surprisingly uh, uh, very, very um, uh, interesting in terms of the data analysis because uh, uh, not, not al always we, we, we need to look at the single cell resolution. Sometimes we want to uh, have a very clear signal of the TCU region, and here is what uh, we, we can see. So, for example, this part of the brain here, if we use a single cell resolution, we, we do detect uh, the, the, the signal at the uh, single cell uh, level. But if you want to look at the brain uh, region, then uh, maybe using bin 80 is uh, giving us uh, the better, uh, better signal. And uh, uh, this is the clustering of the brain. So we can see this cluster, very distinct cluster for the dentate ridges, and that's, uh, that is the the, the, again, the data-driven way of identifying the region in the brain and, and, and uh, 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 suggesting that this type of data is really sensitive so that we can uh, uh, locate a different sub-area uh, of the hippocampus. Um, and uh, the heat map here is showing the uh, unsupervised way of finding the uh, gene signature for different TC region. And uh, we can see that um, the, the signature can, can be very specific to different spatial location in the, in, in the tissue. So that is a, a, a really um, uh, impressive uh, uh, way of, uh, of looking at the data and, and understand the tissue at different scale from single cell to the, uh, the tissue area. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, we perform the comparison between young and old uh, um, uh, mice across the five organs, and we could detect the uh, uh, genes that are highly expressed in the old uh, or highly expressed in the young mice, and then we could perform uh, like a standard pathway analysis. Uh, interestingly, the ligand receptor interaction turned out to be the most, uh, the top uh, and, uh, enriched pathway uh, in the old um, uh, organs. And uh, um, when we integrate two types of data, so here we integrated the visium data and ST omics data, we could identify 86 genes that consistently upregulated between the two technology. And interestingly, among those 86 genes, uh, the top genes uh, in here could be validated by independent uh, single cell uh, data sets. For example, here we have a complementary factor 4B so that's uh, the top most upregulated in the age uh, mouse, uh, uh, and it's also the top upregulated from the single cell analysis. But what is uh, um, uh, the addition to, to this is uh, not only we, uh, th do we know that this genes are upregulated, uh, but it's also uh, we, we could find the, the spatial location of where in the young brain that is expressed much more compared to the in the age brain. So that is uh, so. This is one example of the oxytocin genes, and then we can look at uh, uh, the example of that uh, complementary 4B uh, factor. So here, in this case, it's uh, much higher in the age uh, and uh, and lower in the young, and it's uh, enriched for the fiber tract in the brain. So that is the the, the uh, compared to the single cell. That's the additional information we can get, and when we compare com combine the the five uh, tissues together, we could identify a core set of genes that consistently upregulated uh, in, uh, in, in the, in the age um, uh, mice compared to the old mice, and, uh, and that uh, upregulated genes is, uh, in here, the top one is the complementary factor 4B, so that's related to the immune type pathway that create up the, the, the dead cells. Um, and, uh, um, uh, the most interesting part of this, uh, this uh, study when we apply the spatial uh, data uh, to, uh, to analyze the aging process is to study the communication between the cells. And uh, we develop a algorithm where we can make the use of the neighborhood between the cells uh, so that uh, we can test for the two cell types that are using two uh, ligands and receptors as a mean of communication that are much uh, higher than random 
pairs of genes and random pairs of cells. So, uh, so that uh, uh, approach using spatial data for cell-to-cell -cell interaction can reduce uh, the false positive detection. That is the key uh, limitation in terms of studying cell-to-cell -cell interaction using the genomics data. Um, and uh, we could uh, make the comparison between cell-to-cell -cell interaction between the aged and young mice. And this is an example of looking at the, um, the, uh, the pair of cells that interact much more in the age or much more in the young. So uh, that is the, the, the current uh, work that we have done so far. And uh, this is an ongoing work. We're looking for more collaboration. So uh, uh, if you have a relevant sample, so if you are interested in uh, working with us to add more uh, tissues uh, type, uh, please uh, 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 reach to us and we really welcome the collaboration. So we, we've shown that uh, we apply the stereo seq for multiple organs and the analysis comparing between the young and the age uh, reveal some of the biological processes, especially the complement pathways that are consistently upregulated in the age mice and the complement pathways are actually drug druggable uh, pathways that uh, we can aim to, uh, to reverse or slow down the aging process uh, in the cases that uh, it might cause the diseases. And then we have identified the ligand receptor interactions that are, um, appear to, to play key roles in the aging process. And in the future work, we are looking at validating this type of, uh, uh, of, of uh, findings in the human uh, samples. So I'd like to finish by acknowledging my uh, team. So it's the analysis led by Guiyan, uh, Peng, and uh, Unju and Levi, and then the data generations by uh, Yufan and Albert. And uh, thanks for our collaborators. So for each organ, we have uh, an expert domain to work on that uh, uh, particular organ. And uh, thanks for the funders, and especially thanks for the BGI for the great collaborations, and uh, thanks for your attention. Do we have any questions for Kwan? Yes. Is it on? Oh my God, it is on. Thank you so much, Kwan. That was really wonderful. Um, I had a question about the integration. You said that you integrated with Visium. I'm curious, number one, like what bin size you needed to go for, given that it's sort of spot based, but then um, StereoSeq is like, can be really highly resolved. Um, and whether the approach is sort of spatial aware or not? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, we are still working on uh, different strategies to integrate the two data type. Um, uh, but what we have done so far was yeah, as actually tested different bin size. So bin 80 is where the visum and STOMIC have a similar size of around 50 to 55 micrometer. And we see the two data types are very comparable in terms of genes detected um, and also the spatial pattern. Um, uh, but we are very interested in the comp complementary part between the two uh, data type and the single cell resolution, the bin 14, is the one that uh, give us uh, a lot uh, of interesting in, uh, information about cell-to-cell -cell interaction at single cell level. Um, so uh, the computationally, the way we are thinking of uh, uh, integrating these two data sets would be like to find the neighbor cells uh, in, the, in the gene expression space. And then from there, we hope that uh, the cell type identification uh, of the ST omics, which is supposed to be at a higher resolution, can inform the deconvolution of the, of the visium. Yeah, yeah. And we also have a way to map the two adjacent sections so that we can actually map the single cell, the STL mix, to the spot of the, of the visium. And that's another way to do the convolution experimentally. So, yeah. Hi, Kwan, uh, Ranch and Thomas. Yeah. So the complement receptor and the complement four is really interesting. Do you see yeah. that the macrophages are close to the cells that express the complement or are they far away? In other words, is the cleanup of the dead cells actually happening or is there just inflammation being perpetuated? Yeah, so uh, 
we, we, we observe that uh, across uh, all five organs, but for the macrophage, uh, we observe it more in the spleen and the liver. Um, we, we suspect that the compromised factors produce in a high amount in the liver, and then it got transported uh, to other organs. So currently, we are testing a, a very interesting approach that we haven't seen anybody try it yet, that is uh, to see which organ uh, uh, produce which ligands and what other organs have uh, the receptors expressed and whether there's a, a downstream effect of that ligand transported to the distal organs that have uh, the re receptors and that allow us to study the uh, distal uh, communication between organs uh, and complement uh, pathway, I think is an ideal pathway for that. Hopefully we can see the signal from liver to the brain and uh, to, to the peripheral organ like the heart and the kidney. You might want to look at the gut. That's where ultimately yeah. it comes from to get to the liver. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're interested, uh, let's sure. chat and, and yeah, thank you. Thanks for a great talk, yeah, Juan, on a really yeah. interesting project. You've shown how it's really powerful to be able to sort of bin at different resolutions. Yes. I wondered how the, the segmentation approach that was mentioned by Kira that's coming yeah. sort of fit into the workflow. Yeah. And I have you tried, you know, the SOAR approach and, and yes. been able to get that to work? That's a great question. Yeah. We we, we, we try the SOAR approach uh, with the latest, uh, latest version of the pipeline. It worked really well. Um, and uh, the advantage of doing cell segmentation is that we, uh, instead of looking at the bin 14, that we have a signal everywhere across the tissue section, now we have uh, the signal uh, where the cells are. So th there's, there's a lot of uh, like empty space between two neighboring cells that, that uh, has no signal and that's accurate measurement. If we bin them, then we have a less resolution. The signal diffuse a bit between two neighboring bin. So uh, uh, yeah, so the, the, the segmentation uh, is, is, is a good, good way to, to, to do it. And, uh, and we, we, we apply the default uh, the like stereotic, uh, the, the saw pipeline for segmentation. And, uh, and, and it worked well. So we're working on the visualization of, of that, how to, how to show the, the individual cell and the signal that map to the cell. Thank, Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm always interested in research in diseases I might get, and I think ageing catches everyone. So probably like a lot of people, I'll be Googling this afternoon how to upregulate my OXFOS pathway. So, um, so now I'd like to introduce a, a rising star from the West. Uh, Dr Jennifer Carenti is a postdoctoral fellow in the Sharma lab based at the Harry Perkins Institute of Medical Research in conjunction with the Curtin University in Perth. Here they explore similarities between fetal and tumour microenvironments with respect to T cells in hepatocellular, hepatocellular carcinoma, having recently contributed to a review in Nature Reviews Cancer and on oncofetal reprogramming and its implications in cancer development and progression. Furthermore, they are assessing the impact of oncofetal reprogramming within the tumour microenvironment on immunotherapy outcome, in part by employing several spatial technologies. Jennifer was invited to present their work on spatial technologies during a BioCompare webinar and is currently working with a newly developed StereoSeq technology to identify markers of an immunotherapy response in hepatocellular carcinoma. Jen's talk is titled Stomix GenX, when StereoSeq meets jump code. Thank you, Richard, for that introduction, and especially a big thank you to uh, Decode Science and BGI for inviting me to present this work for you in this lovely and early breakfast workshop. So these are my disclosures. So just in one day of multiomics, we've already heard a lot of talks that really highlight the um, importance and the applications that spatial transcriptomics can have in research. And so these um, technologies really help to provide that uh, spatial context within a tissue that you do lack with um, solely single cell technologies. 
And so it's a relatively new um, technique arising from around 2016 that has really expanded quite rapidly in the number of techniques available as well as the number of publications that do cite these techniques. Yet with all of these uh, new technologies revolving around our spatial transcriptomics, there are a lot of variations within them. One of these is the field of view or the capture area. So it ranges from a, quite a small capture area where you can only look at a very small section of tissue to currently the largest capture area, which is uh, StereoSeq at the moment. The next is the resolution, so ranging from a low resolution where you are looking at several cells within one spot to a single cell resolution and also a subcellular resolution. But perhaps one of the most important aspects for finding new um, answering biological questions and also for the clinical translation is the detection efficiency. So you can see here on the x-axis several different spatial technologies grouped by their resolution. You can see that there is uh, um, a difference between the detection efficiency for some of these technologies. Now, while our group does use several of these um, technologies, I'm going to be telling you about our work with Stromics. So Kira's already nicely covered this, um, as well as Klang, but we have the um, StereoSeq uh, technology on the Stromics chip. And I won't go through this too much, but I have included what I think and still think is a pretty cool video um, where you can see the tissue being mounted onto the chip itself. So here I'm holding the chip with forceps, um, and this is uh, the newer version. It does have it on a slide, so just keep in mind that this is the um, original version that we're using here, the first version, sorry, I should say. Um, and you can see the tissue section on top of the chip. So hopefully that plays. So you can see the heat from my finger does mount that um, tissue section onto the chip. And one thing I just want to point out here is that this is a uh, poly T, so it's a poly A capture system. And as we've seen with similar um, single cell technologies using this capture technique, there is, uh, you do see a lot of ribosomal and mitochondrial content um, within this data. And this has led to um, some bioinformatic pipelines that try and reduce this noise um, when you are annotating and clustering cells. So this paper um, here oops, was recently published um, in Nature just a few months ago. And it's really nice to exemplify in this paper how they have reduced um, the effect of ribosomal mitochondrial content. So they have regressed out the percentage of mitochondrial data um, before their initial clustering. And then when they wanted to subcluster their cells, they actually completely removed um, 1,500 genes associated with mitochondria, um, heat shock proteins, and ribosomes. And so this raises the question, can you actually do this in vitro rather than computationally? So currently there are a few different technologies that try and tackle just this. One of them is twist biosciences. So this uses a targeted approach. Um, it is probe-based, and they have existing panels available, but you can customise your own, and it is scalable. So you can look at a few hundred to several thousand genes. And a second option uh, is targeted depletion. So this is your CRISPR clean from Jump Code Genomics, and they target genomic reads alongside mitochondrial and ribosomal reads and also non-variable genes. And this does have a customisable aspect as well. And so we wanted to go for a unbiased approach, and so we did go for um, CRISPR-Clean. So we wanted to combine stomics with CRISPR-Clean to see if we can increase the detection efficiency. So you've seen this pipeline a little bit from Kira earlier, and so in green we have your conventional stomics pipeline, and then in purple I've highlighted where we are bringing in CRISPR-Clean. So what we do is we have your um, tissue mounted on your chip, we take it through the pipeline, and then when we get to the cDNA section, we actually split it into two, and it either goes through your conventional stomics pipeline, so through the green, or it goes through CRISPR-Clean. So you make your RNPs, you combine it with your cDNA, it undergoes your CRISPR digestion, it's then purified, and then we input it back into the library construction and sequencing. So what this means is that we have your stomics and this new pipeline, which we have termed stomics gen X, or gene expression. Um, it is the same tissue, and so the same spatial locations do match. And we are using um, two samples of liver tissue for this one here. 
Okay, so the first thing we wanted to do was to look at the impact of CRISPR-Clean on genomic data. So there are two samples, sample one and sample two, and on the x-axis you have stomics to the left of each and stomics gen x to the right. And then plotted on the y is the percentage of aligned reads. So you can see if we look at sample one, about 84% uh, of the reads aligned to genomic um, intervals and 16% aligned to your transcriptome. But following stomix gen X, you see that there is an increase of 42% of these reads now aligning to the transcriptome. And a similar pattern is seen for sample two. So what this is showing us is that with CRISPR-Clean, stomix gen X then allows for a reduction in, this, um, in the number of genomic reads that are detected. And it also allows for a redirection of these reads to now be towards the transcriptome. And so after this, we wanted to know, does this uh, translate to an increase in the number of genes detected? So looking at the library complexity, we downsampled each library to 1 million reads, 2 million, and so on and so forth. And we counted the number of genes that have 10 or more reads at each um, library uh, uh, amount. And what we found was that there was consistently a higher number of genes detected in stomix gen X. So these solid lines compared to the conventional stomix pipeline, these dashed lines here. And so what this means is that while you also um, do detect more genes, you also can sequence at a lower level, which obviously saves you some money and allows you to run more samples. Yet so, uh, the CRISPR-Clean technology doesn't only target genomic uh, reads, it also targets ribosomal and mitochondrial content. So we next wanted to see if this is reduced. And what we found was a 2.3-fold decrease and a 2.7-fold decrease in the total percentage of ribosomal and mitochondrial content using Stomix Gen X. And if we look at this spatially, you can see that this top one um, it displays the ribosomal and mitochondrial count, um, in stomics, and then you can see that reduction shown spatially following stomics gen X. So now that we have seen that there is a reduction in the number of genomic reads alongside mitochondria and ribosomal content, we wanted to see if this increase in genes detected then translated to imp an improved ability to annotate cell types and clusters. So I'll take you back to this slide just quickly to um, remind you of how we analyze the data. So we do this in bins. So as has already been explained, if you go two by two, so including four bins, that would be your bin two, because it's two by two spots, sorry. And um, as has been mentioned, bin 14 is roughly one cell, and the analysis from here on will be showing at bin 50. So we're looking at about two to three cells. So when we wanted to annotate the five major cell types, we found that we did actually find an increase in the number of bins that detected some canonical genes for these major cell populations, as you can see through this table here. So I'll just first take you through the major cell type of this tissue being liver tissues, obviously your hepatocytes epithelial cells. And you can see, th oops, uh, this one. So you can see here that in Stomix and Stomix Gen X, you do see an increase in the expression of these canonical markers for this cell type. And if I plot that as a um, histogram, you can see that the um, UMI count does shift to the right, indicating a higher expression. And this maps to what we see within the tissue itself. If we go to the next most dominant population is our myeloid cells. And we found an increase of 1,227 bins that do detect some of these canonical genes for myeloid cells. And again, we do find that there is an increase in the number of uh, bins with the UMIs um, mapping back to these genes. Next, if we look at fibroblast genes, there is an increase in 732 bins uh, that were detected with fibroblasts. And again, um, if we look at the histogram, interestingly here, we do see that at bin 50, sorry, that UMI count of 15 and above, we only detect this following Stomix Gen X. So this is suggesting that um, this new uh, combination of these two technologies leads to an increased gene detection for these canonical markers. So now that we have seen that there is an um, enhanced ability to um, detect these different cell types within a bin, we next wanted to know, is there a, uh, any impact on the highly variable genes detected? So 
So when we looked at um, the residual variants for all of these genes in both technologies, which you can see on the x-axis here, um, we put in a count of, sorry, uh, um, cutoff of 1.4, and we uh, annotated anything above that cutoff as being a highly variable gene. So what this uh, showed us is that there were an additional 592 genes that were marked as highly variable genes following stomix Gen X. And what's interesting to note is that of these genes detected, uh, se roughly 1,700 in stomix and 2,300 in stomix Gen X, there was some overlap in what was denoted as highly variable, yet between each technology, there were some unique to each. So if we look at those that were only labelled as highly variable genes with stomix, we found that 21 of these, shown in red, were mitochondrial and ribosomal genes. And what this plot is showing you on the x-axis is the UMI count for each gene following stomics, and on the y-axis is stomix Gen X. So it's important to note that we do actually detect all of these genes in stomix Gen X, but they're just not labelled as highly variable genes. For the mitochondrial and ribosomal genes in particular, falling to the right of this dotted line, which is a one-to-one -one expression, indicates that their expression is higher in stomachs. If we look at those genes that are present as highly variable following both stomachs and stomachs Gen X, you see that their um, expression is a lot more concordant between the two. Um, there are 1,015 of these that were detected in both. And um, what's important for us with our research is two of these genes in particular, so your alpha feta protein, A or AFP, and your haptoglobin, or HP. So these have some relevance in the clinic for hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, that is that AFP is often used for HCC detection, and it can also um, uh, predict recurrence and overall survival. And that's shown nicely um, by this plot here um, from this publication in 2018. So what they did was they took a, um, I think it was 81 patients with um, hepatocellular carcinoma who were about to commence chemotherapy, and they split them into either the um, non-decline group in blue, so that is where the AFP level was maintained throughout treatment, and the decline group in green where the AFP level did decrease during treatment. And what they showed was that in the decline group, there was an increased overall survival, and they did also show this for recurrence as well. And in terms of HP, um, it has been shown to have lower expression in poorly differentiated cancer cells, and it also has several clinical implications um, across several other cancer types. So if we look at the spatial location of these, um, what we found was uh, some spatially resolved hepatocytes. So we can see your AFP high and HP low, and your AFP low and HP high um, cell populations in their in a spatial context, which you would miss with single cell alone. If we look at AFP, we had an increase of 5,505 bins that had any expression of AFP, as you can see between the stomachs on the left and stomachs Gen X on the right. But this is a bit more apparent if we look at the um, UMI count as a histogram, because you can see a shift in the expression to the right and similarly to before, anything with a uh, UMI count of 17 or above was only present in stomachs Gen X. So we do see that increase and shift in expression. So just to summarise, um, we found that with stomachs Gen X, there was a reduction in the number of genomic reads that allowed for these reads to then be redirected to the transcriptome, which did translate to an increase in the number of genes detected. And there was also a decrease in the mitochondrial and ribosomal reads and also their detection as highly variable genes. We found that um, there was improved detection of these cell type markers with, uh, with stromix genetics and that we also were able to identify some clinically relevant um, markers. So I'd just like to um, thank quite a few people. So this work was in collaboration with Luciana and Jasmine and of course BGI and Jump Code. Um, for their support, otherwise this project wouldn't have been possible. And if you are um, interested in this work, we have just released this as a preprint as of Friday, um, so do check it out and read more if you are interested.